And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living word of God, which is Christ our Lord. Okay, let's get into the uh, Isaiah chapter 18. It's a, it's a short chapter uh, talking about the, uh, the area of Cush, which is Ethiopia today, the Sudan, Somalia, um, how the Lord is uh, going to have judgment against those, those people for not seeking the Lord's face and how the Assyrians that they're referring to are going to conquer them. Remember, in this particular time, the Assyrians uh, were a great nation, and uh, they, they became um, they took, o took over northern Israel, or uh, what we call Ephraim, or Israel, because after Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the, the, king sh or the, the, the nation split. Judah and Israel being two separate nations, Judah being uh, with the two tribes and the remnant of the other tribes, of Israel, headquartered in Jerusalem. And uh, so we see the king in the book of Kings, and uh, that you see good king, bad king, all the way through the Judah kings, and we don't see any good kings through the northern Israel because they set up their, their holy place in Ephraim. And we see that the Assyrians took over uh, Israel first, and uh, the Lord uh, spared them because of Hezekiah's prayer, as we'll see later on in the book of Isaiah. Hezekiah humbled himself and prayed, and the prophet Isaiah was given a vision uh, from the Lord that he would spare his life for another 15 years, but also would spare them from the Assyrians taking over. And one angel on one night uh, executed 185,000 Assyrians. That's the power of the Lord. And the whole purpose of Isaiah 18, uh, again, there's uh, dual meanings here. Isaiah and the prophecy Prophets, again, give you immediate prophecy, a midterm prophecy, and then an end-of-time prophecy. So we're going to read through both of them. One is going to apply uh, uh, to the immediate and one to the, to the short-term, being the Assyrians, which take over this land. And then the end-time pro pro prophecy, especially the Assyrian. We know through the Scripture that the Antichrist will be an Assyrian. So that will be over the area of an, the Assyrians had control of. He'll come from that area. And, uh, and it's my strong, strong, strong conjecture that this man who will become a diplomatic or a businessman will have great, great uh, charisma, charisma uh, and also he will be of, uh, of a Muslim. That the area of Assyria, the Assyrians covered over the, the Muslim countries today, especially when we look at northern Africa, the Middle East, all Muslims, very strong in Muslims. The only one sticking out is uh, Israel, the democracy, Israel, and God's beloved. Okay, let's get into the scripture and we'll explain it as we go. Here we go, 18.1. Uh, Woe to the land shattered with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So the original text talked about Cush. Cush is, uh, it means black uh, in Hebrew. They were literally black men. This is where we get... Uh, the, the African heritage from it came from Ham, who was the son of Noah, obviously. So that's where we get that. And in your in your Bible today probably shows Ethiopia, but the original text said Cush. Cush is in the area of Ethiopia, Sudan, and Somalia. So we know those three areas, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Somalia, not only are there uh, Africans, uh, black Africans there, but that is highly uh, Islamic as we speak today. And the Lord is talking about the short term and long term. And he's talking about the shadow of buzzing wings. So that's a threefold at least message showing us that that, that was infected with uh, insects. That was true at the particular time. That the locusts specifically were coming out. It is also a uh, diploma diplomatic. They were they're scrambling to come up with a, a political solution because they know the Assyrians are going to take them over. And also has reference to the, the buzzing in the end times in the book of Revelation with the locusts. These are demonic locusts. These are not a regular locust. If you see in the book of Revelation, they're actually demonic, uh, de demonic spirits that will have this... Uh, uh, the, this, uh, this, this body that's grotesque, sharp teeth, they'll have ha long hair, and uh, uh, many people who have experienced near-death experiences and have seen hell have witnessed these type of people. Some of them call them frog-type creatures, but they're called locusts. And we know in the Septuagint uh, that the locust refers to uh, the, the king of the locusts, and that is the demonic reference to the, these locusts that we're going to see in, in Revelation. So they're, in Revelation, we may see a literal locust, but it also was a demonic edge to it. And so this is going uh, short term and all long term. Um, so verse 2, which sends ambassadors by the sea, even vessels of reed of water, saying, 
Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth as skin, to a people terrible from the beginning onward, and a nation powerful and trending down whose land the rivers divide. So he's, he's, they're trying to make a political uh, solution. The Assyrians were wicked. I mean, they were uh, uh, just absolutely uh, horrific in some of the things they did. A modern, uh, you know, terrorism to the, to the up, utmost. Fear was the n number one thing they tried to do, and they d did uh, horrible things, taking the skin off people, um, gruesome deaths, cutting people's heads off. Um, uh, when they would come into a battle, they would see uh, the, the, the army um, uh, laying there, and they'd come up and surprise them, and they would kill uh, three out of four, and the one that would wake up would look to the le left and to the right and see them br brutally uh, mutilated, and that was to give up their will, their will to fight, and uh, that's how the Assyrians worked. Uh, it's similar to what we see with ISIS uh, today, with this uh, demonicness going through the, uh, ISIS and beheading and killing children and, and uh, uh, toxin gas. We saw that there was uh, toxin gas spread on Syria uh, yesterday. Uh, and remember in Isaiah 17, 1, that could be uh, one of the reasons why uh, Damascus shall be no more. We were, we were talking in Isaiah 17, 1 about uh, the prophecy of Damascus 17 that uh, in one day Damascus would be no more. And that's called the, the Samson option in the IDF, uh, Israel Defense uh, Forces. If uh, um, a, a plague or a toxin was put on the nation of Israel or a nuclear weapon, it's called the Samson option and they would obliviate the city of Damascus. So these prophecies are right on our doorstep and we're seeing this in short term and we're seeing the day of the Lord coming uh, before us real soon and we, as we see. Verse 3, and, it all, and going back to 2, they're, they're trying to look for a political solution instead of looking to the one true God. They're trying to look for a military power instead of the one true God who had one angel destroy 185,000 Assyrians in one night. So that is for us as Christians too. We don't look for political power to get us out of trouble. We don't look for a mighty army of nations to get us out of trouble. They're all man. And God is sovereign. God, Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit takes domain and is the Lord of hosts. We're going to see that title in Isaiah 18 on the Lord. Not only is he the Lord of hosts today, but especially when he comes back and speaks it in with his sword in the book of Revelation and what Daniel referenced, um, that the Christ, the Messiah, would come back as the Lord of righteousness and the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is a military term, and he is our power. He is our military, not the United States military or the Russian military or whatever military. These are man's military. We see in Psalm 2 that, that, that God sees all the nations, and they build up their armor. They build up their, their pride. They, pit up, they build up their money and their power. And it says, he who is in heaven sits and laughs. He sits and laughs because he is almighty and he has sovereign control over all things. And all he asks for us is to give us, give our heart to him and we'll have that peace no matter what's happening in the world. So brothers and sisters around the globe, I, tell, I speak to you, don't look for a political answer. Don't look for a military answer. The answer is the Lord of hosts. The answer is the beloved Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah who died on a cross so that we could have eternal life with him. He is the only way. He is the power. He is the glory. And he is the living word. And we need to eat that living word as he says, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. We need to consume ourselves for that because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No other military, no other political entity will ever come and stand before the name of the Lord. All right, verse 3, all inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, when he lifts up a banner on the mountains, you see it. When he blows a shofar, you hear it. So this is a reference that uh, they would blow the shofar in the t time of battle. It's also a time where they t talk about the Feast of Trumpets. They blow the shofar to, to issue in the, 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 the festival of the Feast of Trumpets. Mountains are always an idiom or a symbol. Again, expositional constancy is a fancy theological term saying the Holy the uh, Holy Spirit is always consistent in its idioms. Mountains always represent governments. So he's talking not only about a literal mountain, but he's also talking about a government. So that's why when we go into the book of Revelation, we see the mountains uh, go into the sea. Sea is another idiom throughout the scripture. Not only is it literally a mountain will go into a literal sea, but it is a mountain means a government will go into 
uh, the final death, sin. C is always a representative of death, the final sin. That's why we see it throughout the scripture. And that's why we see in the book of Revelation that when the Lord Almighty opens up the, the white throne judgment and the millennial reign is over and we usher in eternity with the Most High God and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit, there's no more sea, there's just living water. There's no more sun, there's no more moon because the sea represents evil, the second death, and it will be put away. And the banner, that banner is the Lord of righteousness, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah in three, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And when he blows the shofar, that means the coming of the Lord, the, 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 the rapture. And again, as we spoke on many other uh, um, Teachings, if you can get this more on uh, www.hisglory.tv, is our teachings on the seven festivals of Israel, why are they important, and Jesus has literally fulfilled uh, all uh, four of those, and then the three are to be fulfilled. The next one is the fifth, and fifth represents grace, and that is the Feast of Trumpets, and it's my belief that is what Paul's referring to as the last trump, and that will be the harpazo in the Greek, the rapture of the church. So it's eminent. All the prophecy has been fulfilled for the church to be taken. Verse 4, <coughs> excuse me, for, the so, for so Jehovah said to me, I will take my rest, I will look for my dwelling place like clear heat and sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of our harvest, saying I will take control. We see that he takes control of the Assyrians by uh, using the Babylonians, and God is always the conqueror. But he's also talking about the end times to the, to the last day Assyrians and the last day empires that reemerge that we see in the, in the book of Daniel. And we see the, the, the different uh, military powers of the world that, da that Daniel's referencing and the book of Revelation is referencing that they all come together, the nations that ruled against the Most High. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ and he comes back with the, the title, Living Word, Lord of Hosts. Uh, and he'll be in the order of Melchizedek, meaning King of Righteousness, and that, and he will speak it in because he is the word, the living word, and the, and the sword is always the the word of God. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripen, ripening in the flower, he will but, but cut off the sprigs, and and pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches. So the Lord is going to cut down those branches. Not only is he going to cut down, and he did cut down according to this prophecy, the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And now we are talking about end times when the Assyrian, the great Assyrian, who is great in his own mind, he's great in the power of Satan, will be an antichrist. He will, in my belief, uh, my, my conjecture will be uh, is Islamic and will create an Islamic caliphate to try to rule the world and be bringing uh, Christianity and um, uh, Islam into one. And that's blasphemy. We see the Pope is even... Uh, dangerously approaching this subject, and that is just absolute blasphemy from the Lord. You shall have no other gods but the, the, but Elohim, and you shall have no more uh, false idols. The Lord does not want us to put the Bible and the Quran together. God is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He's jealous of his name, and he's jealous of his word, and his word and name stand alone and one. Yahweh, the I am that I am, and, the, and what we call in Hebrew, Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, praise his name. And he will take, he will take sovereignty, just like he did to the Assyrians. The second, the second coming of Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The, the, uh, fulfill the Davidic covenant for a thousand years to reign uh, in Jerusalem uh, for, the, in, for the entire world, and every knee will bow to, to Christ, our King of Kings and our Lord of Hosts. They will be get together for the mountain birds of prey. We see this in the book of Revelation too, that the, 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 the birds, again, birds are an idiom of evil, will attack uh, the, the, the death uh, of this, the sin. And that's what sin does, sin attacks sin. We see that in, in the days of Noah, they were turning against each other. And you, if you read the book of Yasser, you see why God created the dinosaur. It was to, con to kill these, these, these fallen angels that mated with the fair women and they had these offsprings that were demonic and these demonic entities, whether some were half uh, human and, and half fallen angel and some of them actually uh, messed the seed with animals. And that's where we get all the... Uh, you know, we get all the uh, the, the legends from uh, all different tribes all over the world about this super race, the Greeks and the, and the Romans. Uh, these were these literally happened, 
and uh, this came from the false seed of the, of the serpent. And those days are going to happen again. And we see that, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about the locusts. Uh, they are demonic in nature, and they take on a form of a, of some sort of of a of a, of a body of a, a thing we have never seen before. So it's very important that we stand tall and remember back to the, the first prophecy in the Bible, where it said the seed of the woman, and that's bi- biologically incorrect because the seed comes from the man. It says the seed of the woman will crush the head of the sa- snake, and it says the snake will have a seed. And that seed is the demonic seed that the fallen angels fell and mated with the women, the Rephaim, the Nephilim. And it was up to the third century that, that was no, there, there was no controversy. Everybody knew that they were Nephilim and Rephaim. There's over uh, 30-some uh, references to Nephilim, Rephaim, and Anak, which are the long neck uh, uh, gigantes in, in, the, in the Greek, but are fallen, unnatural. And that day would be like the days of Noah coming back again. They will be turning on each other is the point we're talking about. They have turn on each other, demonic turn on each other, and that's why in the book of Yasser, God created the dinosaur. He talks about the behemoth being the land, and he talks about Leviathan being the, 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 uh, the dinosaur of the sea and control of the sea to destroy this demonic race. And then we know he floods the earth to, because of this demonic fallen race. And uh, it, it shows that they had actually a, a dragon that could shoot fire. So that's where we get these legends through the Japanese, the Chinese of these fire shooting dragons. There's, you know, that, that there's biblical truth to that. Verse 7 and closing out. In that time... A present will be brought to the Lord of hosts. Present will be brought to the Lord of hosts. That Lord of hosts is Jesus Christ. He comes back with a military term because he comes back as the kinsman redeemer and he comes back as the Gaal or the Gael in Hebrew, meaning the blood redeemer. He is the only one who can redeem the blood. And God is so particular to blood because it is the soul that houses the blood. That's why God takes the blood so seriously. That's why he says it's only the blood of Christ that can save us and he can repent and our sins will be a scarlet that will be washed as white as snow is what Isaiah is told from the Lord. And that's why blood, he's, that's why God has always said, drain the blood, take care of the blood, do not drink the blood. The blood is so important and uh, we, we need to be honoring that. And you see some of these demonic things with, with vampires. And uh, what do vampires drink? Their blood. Because why do they, why do they in the movies keep uh, these vampires? Why do they want to drink blood? Because it was life that kept them living and kept going. They had to have virgin blood. Virgin meaning someone that, that hasn't been tainted. And virgin in the scripture uh, it, it represents those who accepted Jesus Christ are become virgins. That means we are pure washed away from the sins of our past, present, and future because of him taking it to the, taking it to the grave, taking it to uh, Golgotha for us and raised again, witnessed by over 500 people, Jesus Christ raised again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father as our high priest and will be coming soon as we say in 187, the Lord of hosts, the military term, how he's going to speak it into uh, fruition. From a, te- from a people tall and smooth of skin, again, representing the Assyrians at this particular time, but is also talking about the end days with the, with the caliphate of Islam and the Assyrian who will be an antichrist. We know in scripture that the, he is an Assyrian. So it has to be in the area that the Assyrians uh, well, built up. And from a people terrible from the beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down, whose lands or rivers divide, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, to Mount Zion. And God calls the Lord of hosts. This is where Jesus Christ will literally reign in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, and will be the King of kings, the Lord of hosts, for 1,000 years, fulfilling the Davidic covenant. And King David, we know in the book of Jeremiah, will sit and uh, be the king of Israel again, with Christ being the king of the world. And, and it will usher in thousand years. And then after the thousand years, the white throne judgment is, is judged of all sin, uh, that they did not, re- people who did not repent. You don't go to hell because you're a sinner. We're all sinners. You go to hell for one reason. You had a hardened heart and you denied the most high God and his son, Jesus Christ, which is the way, the truth, and the life. We have all sinned and fall far short of the glory of God. And that's what makes the Bible such a beautiful thing. We see people that have fallen, Abraham and, 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 and Noah being drunk and Moses killing somebody and David having adultery and, and killing Uriah. 
But their hearts loved the Lord and they gave their heart and the intent of the heart was forgiveness. And our God is a forgiving God if we are truthful in our heart and he will reconcile us through his own son, the blood, again, which carries the soul, which will rest with the Lord, the Lord of hosts, in eternity forever because of the intent of our heart. That's what's the difference between going in an eternal life and being thrown in the lake of fire. Going to the lake of fire and the white throne judgment is the denial of Jehovah God, Elohim, and specifically now under the new covenant, the Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. If there was any other way, then Jesus, then God the Father would have gave him another way. Jesus asked three times, Father, take this cup. If there's any other way, there is no other way. And when we see in the, in the, in the, um, in, in, in the Gospels where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It used to bug me uh, a lot when uh, I first started uh, getting into uh, nurturing the Bible years ago. And I uh, said, well, oh my goodness, God had abandoned him. The father abandoned him. What, what's he talking about? My God, my God. And he's quoting King David. And in the Hebrew, you know, the word Elohim represents God in three. So this is how precise the Bible is. You go to what Jesus is saying on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, David says El, El. El is the singular term for God. When you see Bethel, house of God. Um, uh, so it, it, in, in that particular time, which was extremely rare, David used the word El, El. And the Lord put on my heart what that means. That means that moment in time, God the Father, who is holy and pure, and the Holy Spirit, the third head of the Godhead of the Trinity, those two had to be removed from Christ, who is the second of the Godhead, the Son of God, and he literally had to be the man and take on all the sins of the world and be separated from the Father in that moment in time to take our sins, past, present, and future. Not only did he die a gruesome death, a painful death, because he loved us so much, but he was even separated from the Holy Spirit and the Father for that moment in time because that's the only way that we could get to heaven was through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why he said, El, El, why have you forsaken me? Meaning God the Father and the Holy Spirit because the third, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the third of the Trinity had to be separated as a man and take that on uh, uh, that sin on the world and for us to repent in our heart and accept him as Lord and Savior of our life. We pray that Isaiah 18 has been a blessing to you. Until uh, Isaiah 19, may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Bless each and every one of you. Till next time. God bless.